You can see here the wind force that changes based on how close we are to the wind center. If you take it a notch down, we are closer to it, so you can see that we go faster. Hi, I'm Ricky. Today we're on the 19th episode of the Endless Thunder series, and in this episode we'll take a look on how to implement whirlwinds to our game. And what I mean by that is a type of enemy that drags you in, and when it sacks you to the center, you lose. This is a pretty straightforward episode, we're just gonna make this new enemy and then add a bit of randomness at the end. We just need to update another script that's a really easy fix, no need to worry, so let's start. This series is based on a video game that I already made and published called Boat Venture. If you want to know how this finished product will look like, do check it out, link in the description, it's free for all Android devices 9 plus on the Play Store. Alright, first thing you wanna do is import our sprite for this episode. And here it is, you can of course use it and download it for free, link in the description. So let's go in our prefabs and let's duplicate our rock. I'm then gonna rename it and change the sprite. I'm also gonna change the collider so that it's only a tiny bit in the center. Like this, I think it's good. I don't want all the parts of a whirlwind to be effective, only the center should actually damage the player, I think. But of course, it's just personal opinion. Then let's remove entity type script and let's make and add a new component and I'm gonna call it whirlwind. In here, of course, we want to inherit from entity type. And in here, we want to do two things. First one is detecting the player within a certain radius. And the second one is applying a force to our player towards the whirlwind. So first let's make the variable for the detecting the player part. Great, and let me explain these values. So drag radius, we're gonna use this value to draw a sphere around the whirlwind in which the player is affected. And to actually detect the player, we're gonna use a function that requires a layer mask. So here's why we have a layer mask. And finally, we're gonna calculate the distance between the player and the whirlwind and use that value to calculate the amount of force that we should give the boat. And we use mean value from jack radius to clamp the distance between the player and the whirlwind so that the force doesn't go to infinite and beyond. All right, but let's go to Unity real quick. And in here, let's change, of course, the entity type and we need to make a new one. So let's go to entity type script and I'm gonna add whirlwind and back to Unity. I'm gonna set the entity type to whirlwind as we just made. And we also need to set a layer for the player layer but right now we don't have a specific layer for the player, so let's go and make one. As you can see, I made a new layer on the element 10. So now let's go grab our boat and let's set the default layer to player layer. And we also have a script that is boat collision that changes the layer of the boat. So let's go in the boat collision script and in here we have a function the on lost life without losing that as you can see messes up with the game objects layer and in here the player is set to default but instead of setting to the default layer we set it to the new player layer that we just made so nothing changes here perfect so now if we go back to unity back to the whirlwind we can finally use the new player layer great this way with the function that we're going to use to detect the player within a certain radius we're only gonna detect entities with that certain layer, making everything more lightweight on the machine and easier for us to code. Perfect, now let's go back to the script and we're gonna detect the player in the update function. In here, let's use the physics2d.overlap circle. And this function is gonna draw a circle around a certain position and detect all collision inside of it. So we have to give it a starting position, so transform that position. A radius for the circle, so the drag radius. And finally, if we want to, we can also give it a layer mask, something that you should always do with overlap circle to make everything easier and smooth. Now this function is going to return the collision, so let's save the collision in a new variable. It's not going to actually save the collision itself because we aren't actually colliding, we're just grabbing the collider that we've detected. So this collider to the here is gonna be the box collider in our boat. Now we check whether we have actually hit the boat and using a collider to d as a boolean in a if statement is basically the same as checking whether it's not null, like this. 
what we want to do is calculate the distance between the whirlwind and between the boat. And I want to calculate the distance between the player and the whirlwind, so that if a player is closer to the whirlwind, its force will be higher. So the closer you are to the enemy, the more dangerous it is. All right, so let's make a new float distance. And to calculate the distance between two objects, it's really easy. There's a function that does it for us, and it depends whether we are working on 2D or 3D. In our case, we say vector 2 dot distance. Then we give it the two game objects position. So in our case, we use our transform position, so the whirlwind's position, and the collider's position, so the boat's position. We could also use boat movement dot instance dot transform dot position instead of this. But calling a direct variable like this is quicker than calling a singleton. So it's easier for the machine if we use this variable instead of calling the boat movement singleton. All right, one thing though, the problem with vector 2.distance is that it always returns an absolute number, and we don't want that. We want to know in which direction we should drag the boat. So if the boat is to the right of the whirlwind, the force should be negative. To do that, we just check whether our whirlwind's position is less than the boat's, and if it is, we reverse the distance. And when I say position, of course I meant the x position. All right, then we want to clamp this value. We want to clamp the distance so it never goes below a certain value. And we actually want to clamp the position before we change the sign, sorry. All right, perfect. Then let's make a new float value called force to give. And that's gonna be the actual force I'm gonna send to the boat movement. So let's make a new value in our script called drag force. While drag force is the default force of a whirlwind, we want the actual force that we give to the player to be a variable value that depends on the distance from the whirlwind to the boat. So we say that the force to give is equal to the drag force divided by the distance. This way, when the boat is at the very edge of the whirlwind, the drag force is gonna be halved and as the player gets closer, the value increases and it reaches 100% when it gets to half of the radius because we have set the minimum value to be half of the radius. And then after that, it's just gonna be stuck at 100%. Of course, we can change it. There are a thousand ways where you can do this, but I think this was the most efficient and best way. All right, and let's make also a new value, a private boolean that tells whether we are currently tracking the player or not. And we set this value to true at the end of our if hit player colliders bit of code. And that's the main logic of our script. Now with all this, we actually want to do something. So let's go grab our boat movement script. And in here, let's duplicate the wind force. And let's go down and let's also duplicate the set wind function. Great, then in our fixed update, we just add whirlwind force to the wind force in the second bit of code, right here. Great, now back to the whirlwind. In here we just need to call the set whirlwind function that we just made. And pass in the force to give value. We also want to disable the whirlwind force when the player is not inside the radius or if the whirlwind disappears, so if it reaches the finish line. So first let's worry about going out of a circle. So let's add an else statement in here. And let's check whether in the previous update frame we were dragging the player. So what this means is that every update frame we check whether we are detecting the player. And if we do get it, then we update the whirlwind force. If we don't get it, so if the player is outside our radius, we check whether in the last update frame we were dragging the player. And if it's so, then and only then we want to update the set whirlwind force to zero. We do this extra bit of check so that we don't call the boat movement singleton each frame as much as we have to. In here it's really easy, we can just copy this and change the values. Great, so now we can also escape from the whirlwind. Lastly, let's make sure that the whirlwind 
resets the window win first when it reaches the finish line. So let's go grab the finish line script. And here, as you remember, when an entity reaches the end of a screen, so when it touches the invisible finish line, we call a function on that entity based on what that entity is. Now let's make things a bit smarter. Instead of checking each type of entity, let's just make one single function that every entity type has and we're just going to call that function. To see what I mean, let's go to the entity type script and in here let's duplicate the start entity function. And remember, this is a virtual function, so we can call it on the inheriting uh, scripts and I'm going to rename it on hit finish line. Then in our weird win script, we are going to override that function. And inside of it, we reset the win force. Finally, in the finish line script, in here, when we hit an entity, we just call that function. Perfect. And let's also update this for the entity type of type of booty. So let's go back to Unity. I'm going to make a new script called booty. In here, we're going to inherit from entity type. And we're going to override the on hit finish line. And here we just passed the code that we had in here. So like this. And finally, we remove this part of code. And as you can see, it's much cleaner. All we have to do is go back to Unity, go to prefabs, select the booty. And instead of entity type, I'm going to put the new booty script that we just made. Perfect. Finally, in our whirlwind script, Let's also add a way to actually see the radius of the whirlwind. To do that, we are going to use a gizmo. Now, a gizmo is basically just a drawing or an icon that's going to appear on the Unity editor. To use gizmo, we have to do our functions inside the onDrawGizmos. onDrawGizmos is a function much like awake or update, that is, a function that is called by Unity itself. In here, we use a function called gizmos.drawWireSphere. Draw wire sphere, much like overlap circle, it's going to require an original position and a radius. By using the same values that we use in the overlap circle, we can actually see how big the radius of our whirlwind is. To make it more appearing, let's also change the color by just writing gizmos.color equals color.yellow. Finally, let's add a bit of randomization. To do that, let's call the onStartEntity function. And in here, I want to set the Gregory radius to a random value. To do that, let's add two new values to our script, a minimum drag radius force and a maximum drag radius. And because we're going to change the drag radius in the start entity, we don't need to serialize it. My apologies, I deserialized the wrong value. Drag radius should be serialized, while drag force shouldn't. But because we are going to test it anyway right now, I say we just keep this field serialized as it is for right now. Also, I made a big mistake naming the variables. This isn't the minimum jack radius or the maximum jack radius. This is the minimum jack force and maximum jack force. And I've also messed up the values to change. We shouldn't be changing the jack radius on the fly. We should be changing the jack force. All right, my bad. Now the Final, final thing that we have to add is actually unlocking the whirlwind. This is really easy. Let's go to the unlock enemies manager. And in here we add a new add enemy case. This way, after we unlock the wind, we're going to unlock the whirlwinds. Finally, in Unity, we just need to add our new whirlwind to the list of entities prefabs. And that's it. All right, so here is our whirlwind. And as you can see, we have the gizmo, that is the yellow circle around it. And if you go and select it, by changing the drag radius, you can see that we see the effects taking effect in real time. So the yellow circle represents not only the gizmo, but the drag radius of the whirlwind effect, because it uses the same value to draw the circle. The randomness has chosen a force of 2.5. And now I'm just going to pause the game, so I'm going to remove that booty here. I'm also going to disable the spawn manager and disable the rigid body women so we can see how it looks with a better view. And the wind also interacts with the whirlwind force, so I've also disabled that for the time being. That means if the whirlwind is dragging us to the right, 
and the wind drags us to the left, the two forces can contrast each other or favor each other if they go in the same direction. So for now I just disable the wind. Now if I hit play again, you can see that it slowly goes towards the center and if I go outside the circle I stand still and the closer I get to the wear wind, the faster I go. Of course this is not very noticeable right now so let me pump up the values. So I think that on average a force of 150 is good enough. Of course this is going to change a lot based on how fast the boat is but that's just more of a personal opinion and personal game design. If we select the boat and we go to debug mode, you can see here the wheelwind force that changes based on how close we are to the wheelwind center. And if we actually put down the wheelwind, so it's also closer to us, even if, if on the X is the same, if you take it a notch down, we are closer to it, so you can see that we go faster. And I think that's it. All right, so that's it for this video. Hope you've learned something new. If you have any doubts about the code or any suggestions about the next topic that you'd like to see in the channel, do let me know in the comments. And if you like this content and you want more, please like, subscribe, ring the notification bell and share the video. And in the next episode, we're gonna make a thunderstorm. That's a very easy to make, but exciting effect that I really enjoy. A thunderstorm is gonna make the game a lot darker and at random intervals, a lighting is gonna strike the screen and confuse the player. It's really easy to make, as I said, but it can make a big change in the mood. Alright, so stay tuned and I'll see you in the next video.